Hey everyone, and welcome back to the Heavenly Homestead. Today I want to talk to you about five things that I wish I knew before I started breeding my goats. I'm not claiming to be a professional breeder. I don't have 20 years of experience, but in my experience, these things this far have been working and I wanted to share them with you. Number one is if you're starting with goats, don't, don't, don't line breed. Please don't line breed. Um, line breeding is, for example, let's say that I have Mocha. Mocha has a boy. That boy can be bred back to his mom and he can be bred back to his grandmother and he can be bred back to his aunt. He can be bred to, you know, a sister. He can go up in generations and breed. I've heard a lot of people do this because they only have, they buy a doe that is pregnant um, or, you know, they get two or three goats, she's pregnant and uh, she has a boy. So they keep one of the boys and they breed them back to the mom, they breed it to their aunt and they breed it to the other um, up in generation does. And although there's nothing genuinely genetically wrong with that I this is all advice I don't think it's a good idea now when you're starting with goats uh, you're starting with what you think is best right now but as the years pass you start to realize that some of the things that you are breeding back to that same doe like the, the boy is going to breed back to the mom are just things that are not good um, if there is a line where you just got and you don't know, but they have leg problems, just combining those two are going to make kids with the worst leg possible. And I'm talking about legs not because they look pretty. I'm talking about legs that will start to break down with time. And by the age of four or five, they will be limping and probably need to be put down. There's also other characteristic things like I've seen this happen before that breed the mom to the son and all the horrible, if, if, if they're really, if they, you don't like their personalities, it turns into something completely worse. Basically, long story short, you are accentuating what's the most prominent thing in those goats. So if they have great genetics and you have the perfect mother and you have the perfect son and you breed them, you would... Um, mathematically speaking, we'll get a perfect goat, which I don't think it exists, but let's say you do have that, um, then that would be the only case that you should line breed. But in my experience, and this is our just tips that I, you know, I'm trying to give you, it's just, it, it's never a good idea. So, you may be saving some money by keeping a buck that you will line breed to your does, but in the long run, you don't have that wide genetic pool that will, you know, amaze you or surprise you at the time of freshening those babies. Again, if you have the perfect mom and you have the perfect boy, by all means, but I think that when you start with goats, it's hard to tell what's perfect a boy and what's a perfect mother. Number two, genetics matter, but in the end, it is a lottery. So don't feel overwhelmed at the time of your first breeding um, or your second breeding. I feel like there's a lot of information out there, like useful information. I use it myself. There are some Facebook groups where you can post pictures of your does and people that have more experience will tell you, well, you should breed that doe to a buck that has good legs or that has a better top line or that it has a, you know, the mom has a great udder. It's very interesting to post a picture and see different perspectives from different people. I do it all the time and I think it's an amazing tool. 
but I didn't do it the first year. And I had no idea what a level top line looks like or what a perfect udder should look like. I just bred my girls to the best that I could afford and to the best that I had, which was one buck at the time. Now, I feel like a lot of people are very overwhelmed that very first breeding season because they're thinking about, you know, perfecting something or improving something, which you should always do it. But in the end, it's going to be a lottery. Let's say you have a doe and you buy this very expensive thousand dollar buck to breed to that doe. Chances are you're going to improve things on the babies that they make together. But it's such a lottery. I've seen very expensive bucks being sold on Facebook because they don't pass the udders that they have behind them, meaning in their genetics. And when they throw girls, you just can't believe it's the daughter of that particular buck. The saying goes, um, mothers to sons and fathers to daughters, meaning fathers usually have more influence on what the daughter's udders will look like and, you know, specifically udders, and mothers will give their udders to their sons. Of course, the sons are not going to have an udder, but their babies likely will have grandma's udder. That's the whole saying, and for the most part, it's very true. However, it's not always the case. And genetics can be amazing, but it will take you years to find out if that bug is actually doing for you what you want for your herd. So do not over overthink your first breeding. Just do it and see what you get out of it. If what you're getting out of it, it's an improvement on the mom, I always call that a win. If it's the same as the mom, I think there are some things that need to be tweaked. And another thing is you don't need a breeding pen. Um, when you are starting your herd, you look at different channels. You see different infrastructure that they already have in place. And maybe you just bought your fence and you set it up and you built your goat house out of pallets or, you know, you did a fancy one, whatever the case may be. Um, you spend some money doing that and getting your goats and now it's time for breeding and you think you need a breeding pen. Now, when you have a lot of goats, it is very easy to just throw them with a bug inside a pen and kind of let them do their thing. However, if you only if you're starting and you just have a few does, they will tell you when they're in heat. Uh, there are signs, and I'm gonna do a video about that soon. That and I'll show you what what it looks like. But there are signs that you will be able to see, and that means that you can lock one of the girls inside the barn and bring the buck from his pen because if you if you have more than one buck you don't want to go take her and put her in that pen and bring the buck into the girls area and let them breed for about i don't know i usually do it just three times and it works um, you can let them be together for the day but that's what they are calling hand breeding and by the time that this breeding is done you can take the buck back to his house and you can let the other does out it is really not hard to do it. I've done it several times before and I actually like that process better than just leaving the girls with a box. The only exception that I would put a girl with a box is if they're not going into heat because it's not the season. I find that during the summertime the heats are very short, very silent and it's hard to catch in heat so that would be the only exception where you think okay I need a breeding pen because I'm just gonna throw them in there but you don't need a breeding pen you don't need to have that ready the first year just think about um, effective ways or ingenious ways that you can use the infrastructure that you have maybe you don't have a barn you just have an open shelter maybe you can take the other doe put her outside maybe let them have some grass outside somebody could even stay with that with the goat with a leash while the breeding is happening you don't really have to have everything figured out by 
the first breeding. It's going to take time to build and to actually find systems that work for you because as the years pass, you start to see what it's going to be easier. Like right now for me, I want to do a gate on that side of the fence to be open to this other area where I'm going to be breeding them now that I have a more goats that I really don't want to do that process but I did that and it worked I did it from the very first time I would bring just the buck to the girl and I would lock the other ones into the barn and they would just make babies and then he'd sleep in his own bed that night it's not necessary to have a breeding pen another thing that I want to share with you that maybe I didn't grasp the whole idea in the beginning is that bucks when they're in rut they do need more calories and they do need more food than when they're not in rut if you didn't know weathers can live up to 15 years where bucks live up to I don't know it kind of depends some some six years old some others eight some others nine but it's kind of hard to find a 10 year old buck and that is because they go through the rut each year and it's very hard on their system. Um, they do require more calories. So just a tip, if you are owning a buck for the first breeding season, I would say if you're just feeding them grass hay, maybe incorporate like I've been doing some alfalfa pellets in the morning and at night just to give them that extra something that they need if you don't feed that to them they're not gonna die but their condition is gonna go down they're gonna be skinnier they're gonna lose more hair especially on their legs their their coat is gonna be rough and they are going to take all that extra that they need from their own body and their their condition is just going to go down that's in my personal experience it happened to me with rocky it happened with me with Taz. that first year that they got in a rut i didn't realize how much more calories they needed and adding a little bit of alfalfa pellets not grain but alfalfa pellets did the trick and it really helped them be in good condition throughout the rut season and breeding season uh, if you don't do it you will realize after the rut that they lost muscle you will start to see how they lose muscle um, they are they could be chunky because you know they if they're eating grass hay all that sugar and stuff it will make them look big but once you look at the side of the goat you can tell that they're in not great condition they will start to lose all that depth that some of this bucks have and I started to see that with Rocky the first year he needed that extra something so I started to incorporate more uh, nutritious food which alfalfa is very nutritious I don't overdo it I um, I take the pen well right now we have five boys I give them a um, can of coffee you know that it's not even a can but the Folgers one I'll get one of those full in the morning and one at night and uh, that's what I give them and it helps them stay conditioned throughout the rut and after the rut because otherwise when this is what happens after rut they will require more um, copper they're, you're gonna see that they're gonna struggle with their copper they're gonna require more minerals or they're gonna eat more minerals because they're lacking something um, and they are going to just look not healthy overall their appearance is not gonna be healthy so you're gonna end up deworming uh, doing the copper more often and just doing things that if you added a little bit of alfalfa in my case that's what works for me then it could have made a big difference. Boys are gonna fight. Um, my boys during the rest of the year, they're best friends. They sleep in a pile of goats. Um, they love each other. They rub on each other. They sleep together. They eat together. They drink water together. They love to be with each other, okay? But once rut comes, rut season comes, they start fighting and it's just one of those things that you have to be prepared for. And I'm not saying that you should have a first aid kit just for those um, occasions, but maybe if you can have some vetricin hand so you can kind of spray if they hurt their heads. 
For example, Rocky will lose his little scars every year and will bleed. And so I have to spray Betrosin at least once a day or add some iodine with water in a bottle and just spray on it so it dries quickly. Those are the two things that you can have at hand. Um, Tass, he's pulled. However, since he's fighting with Rocky, who has scars, he gets a lot of um, blood in this area because of the headbutting, constant headbutting. So I do the same. I spray Betrosin or I spray iodine with water and that helps it dry up and it heals. You can also use, once it dries, you can use also use, I'm trying to think of what that stinky thing is. I'm gonna put the name on the screen. That's a, a that's a cream that stinks really bad, but that helps the hair grow back. So you can use that after, you, you know, it's completely healed, and and just be ready. Boys are gonna fight, and you're gonna have to real kind of keep an eye on them and see if they're hurting each other in a way that you need to separate them or that it's able to, they're able to stay together. I've seen on Widem and Reap that she decided to separate them because they are fine separated and that, you know, they were fighting too much. And, and this is what she shared, right? I, I don't know uh, how bad the fighting was, but, but if your boys have been together for a really long time, I think think in my case would be cruel to separate them. I know that they would get used to it but at the same time I think that them fighting the way that they fight here is not so terrible that I need to separate them. So it's gonna be your call if you think that they're okay to be living together or if you need to separate them like I mentioned in the case of Widom and Reap. Whatever the case may be, you are the one that is seeing these animals. You're the one that sees how sad, how happy, how, you know, bad the fighting is. You're the one that makes that final decision. And there's no right or wrong answer as far as that. So just be prepared to keep an eye on your bugs if you have more than one. And make the decision for yourself and not based on something that you saw on YouTube. Because I know that every time I separate Rocky from his brother Duke, it is the saddest pity party that you'll ever see in your life. And yes, uh, William and Reba was saying how sad it was that they were just humping the weathers but let me tell you something duke rather be with his brother and put up with that than be by himself uh, and there's no point of having a weather if it's gonna be by himself i just in my case i think it would be cruel so maybe in your case wouldn't be because they're hurting each other very bad and that's a decision you're gonna have to make mm. lastly all i want to say is have fun um, it's just, you know, breeding season, it comes and goes very fast and then you end up with a bunch of ladies all being pregnant and cranky for five months. And although I do enjoy the part where I see them grow their bellies and start to see new adders on first time moms and all that kind of stuff, it, it's also a time while they're pregnant to get ready for what's coming, which is kidding season. Do you have the things that you need for you know, a, a successful kidding. Do you have the room? Do you have the tools in case of an emergency? Do you have a vet number that you can call in case of an emergency? Pregnancy is kind of another thing, but, but breeding season is fun. It's uh, the planning. Is uh, figure out not only you know what you're trying to produce and when you're tr what you're trying to achieve with the breeding, but also it's fun to think about the colors and think about personalities and think about all those things that for me are really really fun. It's just for me the planning is the best part. Honestly, it's kind of imagining the different possibilities, crunching 